Hello, and welcome to One Spark Stories, the podcast where innovators, creators, and some unsuspecting risk takers share about navigating highs and lows, laughter and tears, and how sometimes all it takes is one spark of inspiration to find your way to happiness. This podcast will leave you inspired to take action on your own purpose as we connect create and celebrate unique sparks around the globe once again proving that it is a small world after all i am your host katie currens and i am beyond excited to have amanda rosaza with us there are two things i not only believe but have seen to be true you learn more when you're having fun and if you have an emotional connection to what you're learning it will stay with you forever And so when I saw these front and center for this woman called the pop coach, I absolutely knew I had to meet her. Amanda is a speaker, a trainer, an MC, and an all around pop culture maven, hence the name, the pop coach. She helps organizations develop their people and create a world-class company culture, all while improving that bottom line. But she does it while incorporating her unique ability to relate absolutely any concept, lesson, skill, lesson, system, process, you name it, it's all connected to popular culture. So you can see where now she's able to pull in that emotional connection she talks about. In addition to her work as a corporate coach and trainer, Amanda is an author, she is a Disney Institute graduate, and a frequent guest on Ticker News in Australia. She was also the creator and MC of Unleash Your inner superhero at Warner Brothers Movie World, which we will get to hear a little bit about today. Instead of me continuing to share her story, let's hear it firsthand from the woman that is using a lifetime of experience in popular culture to help businesses go from potential to performance. She is fun, she is engaging, and she brings impact backed by science. Without further ado, let's chat with the pop coach. Hello, Amanda. How are you? I am fabulous, Katie. How are you? I am thrilled that we have been able to coordinate time because let's see, we, you are in Australia and it is 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for me. And so what time is it for you? So that would be uh, 9 p.m. in the future. In the da, 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 da. exactly, Never Twilight knew that you would. T- We're time traveling now. One spark is like really taken the next level. So leave it to us to change the world. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I am really excited because even as we have had a little conversation, there are so many questions I have, not only about you as the pop coach, but just about. Um, you know, your, your experiences in the theme park, or we'll say amusements industry, how you got hooked on Disney and all those wonderful things. So tell us first a little about who you are as the pop coach. Okay. So the pop coach. So for me, I've always been super passionate about popular culture and personal and professional development. So one day I've gone, okay, how can I put these things together? And I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was already using popular culture concepts, characters, stories, the fandoms, the universes to teach concepts or systems or processes. So then I've gone, well, I I am the pop coach. I'm using these things to teach the people all of the awesomeness. And I was finding because they're so passionate about what they're passionate about and they've got an emotional connection to it, or at least to to certain people, it's relatable. They learn so much and it stays with them. So that's why I, I feel it's so important to carry my pop coach flag. I think that's fantastic. As a fan of popular culture myself, as soon as I just heard you as the pop coach, I thought, this is brilliant. She's taken all the things I love in facilitating and the work you've done as an MC and put a spin of fun and joy. And as you said, emotional connection that resonates with people. So in order to learn more about you and dig a little bit behind your own pop culture fandom, I have a couple questions. So we're going to spark this energy and spark the conversation. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Born ready. Let's do this. 
first step, but your favorite childhood toy? Oh my goodness. You know what immediately pops into my head? There's two things. I had one of those Fisher Price telephones that you pull along on the ground. Oh yeah. Assuming- yeah. And then I also had this um, just baby that I, you know, I treated her so poorly and I used to call her stinky because <laughs> she had, you know, that you would get the toys that had a, a, you know, they count, this is vanilla or lavender, right. or, you know, the scented toys. And I think about in every photo you see me with stinky, she's like being dragged along the ground. That this is poor baby. Fantastic. Had a bassinet, had a, a pram, but no, Amanda's dragging Stinky across the ground. That, yes, my favorite childhood toys, yes. Was Stinky in the phone? It sounds like a show or a comic that you need. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I just, I think I just named the poor baby Stinky. Like, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer this. I was probably three, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> Amanda at three with her limited brain capacity and dialogue. It's brilliant. I love it. So what was your favorite show or movie growing up? Did you have a very favorite? Oh gosh. Like, are we talking, you know, I know. Ten I, years? <laughs> do we need to take phases of life? Because as the pop culture, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can only imagine that there are an abundance of favorites. Look, this could be an all day conversation. You keep it. Brace yourself. Here we go. (laughs) Brace yourself, team. So for me, uh, probably my most, my favorite movie and the most influential one, I'll I'll pick one. So as a child, it was Aladdin. So uh, Disney's Aladdin. So the animated cartoon from 92, I want to say. Then as I got older, I, I actually had the privilege of my first job was at Blockbuster Video, which was amazing. Uh, one of my friends at the time, Stan, had introduced me to Kevin Smith as a mm. filmmaker. So you, if you know him, you know Jay and Silent Bob. Yes. Uh, need I say? Um, so uh, on my wall in my office over there, I've actually got a signed Clerks poster signed by Kevin Smith. So Clerks, oh, cool. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clerks is my favourite movie because uh, he put everything on the line to make that movie. Uh, he... Dropped out of film school and said, I, I just need to make a film. I need to learn how to make a film. I'm just going to do the thing, which was making the film. He racked up, you know, thousands of dollars in debt on his uh, credit cards, which I don't recommend, but this is what he did. <laughs> right. He, yeah, right. So he looked at what he didn't sort of have a vision for this amazing film he could make. He looked at what he had, which was a job at the grocery store and a job at the local uh, video store. And he he looked at what he had, the people he had around him, the tools he had to use, and he built the movie around that just so that he could, you know, create this thing. It, it's a cult classic. If you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And anyone that's worked in any kind of customer service or retail, you have to watch it because it's so relatable. Yes. Relatable. Uh, but just the fact that he was able to tell that story, that is so relatable, uh, not just to people that have been in that space, but to, just to humans in general. But he was able to do it, just bootstrapping that thing together. And as an entrepreneur as well, I just, it just resonates with me. It's just, it's the good stuff. Those are absolutely the stories that I think give a lot of us that are leaning into a passion project. It gives us a little hope and encouragement and that humor, because there are some moments where it's like, whoa, what's the other movie? Yeah. Office space. That's the one that if you are in that traditional role where you're just sitting there every day is the worst day of my life. (laughs) You know, it's those movies as dry as they are. There's something about that relatable humor that goes back to what you're saying. It's the emotional, emotional pull in it. So Clearly, Kevin Smith was an influential person. Are there others that stand out as really helping you find that inner spark in, um, you know, your voice and what you have to offer? Uh, Yeah, I mean, obvious one for me is Walt Disney. I remember being, I, I remember being about 12 or 13 and I had to do, we were given an assignment to do in grade six maybe I was a bit younger beside the point it was grade six and the teacher said okay so for term four you can pick any assignment you want to work on and I was obsessed with Sega Mega Drive at the time and Sonic the Hedgehog and I couldn't do 
Sonic the Hedgehog because I couldn't, this was before we had internet at school even. I know I'm old, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I had to go to the library, you know, those things where they have the books. Um, I had to go to the library and research and there just wasn't any books about Sega or Sonic. So there weren't enough, wasn't enough information. What there was information about was Disney, Walt Disney, Mickey Mouse, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, that whole story. So I ended up immersing myself at that young, impressionable age. And I was already a fan of Disney. And I think most kids are just because that's, that's what we grow up watching. Saturday, we had Saturday Disney here in Australia. So every Saturday morning you're watching Darkwing Duck, um, oh, Bonkers, yeah. Mystical Army, all those classics. Goof Troop. Goof Troop was my Goof show. Troop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Gummy like Bears. Doing all like the Gummy Bears song. Like they, it's all coming yeah. back. I feel like Celine oh. Dion. Sorry. I'm like, it's so I know, right? I know. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, so, sorry. yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's okay. This is why we're here. Nostalgia, pop culture. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I was already a huge Disney fan. I remember my first watch had goofy, I had a goofy analog watch, you know, um, and this really immersed me in what, where it all started, what Walt Disney had to go through to create the parks, Mickey Mouse, you know, uh, all, all of the setbacks and the knockdowns and everything he went through. Um, so I had that sort of in the back of my mind from a very young age and I I guess I, I then sort of did that assignment and that's what got me into that space and really got me fired up about that. So yeah, Walt Disney easily. And even today, I every so often will be like, okay, it's time for another Walt hit. You know, what, what's another book I can read? Uh, what audio books are my best friend, you know, if I'm in the car or just um, if I'm sitting here doing, you know, data stuff, you know, the stuff that doesn't require a lot of brain power um, because, you know, we wear 17,000 hats in our business and sometimes we've got to do the data entry. Um, so yeah, just really absorbing all that. Uh, so, so yeah, Walt Disney is probably my other major one. And I think the other one for me, as someone asked me the other day if I could have dinner with three people, right? The old, the, the old dinner. So it would have been Kevin Smith, and Walt Disney. And the third one for me is Tony Robbins. Uh, oh. So we went, um, I've done, I think, nearly all of his in-person events now. Uh, and the first time I went and did um, Unleash the Power Within, UPW, oh. uh, here in Sydney, that's what sort of set me on the course of, okay, I, I'm really passionate about, um, you know, personal and professional development. How can I pass this sort of knowledge on in my own unique way? And part of my journey was sort of going, okay, how do we have, how does a Tony Robbins event happen at Disneyland? That was kind of the question I, I asked myself. Mm, yeah. What would that look like? So you're combining all of that, personal and professional development in in an immersive experience but in somewhere like Disneyland where all of that magic happens and you've got that emotional connection and it's just so immersive and all happening yeah. and yeah wild so that's that that's a little clue oh, thank you that's a little clue as to where I see my business going taking cohorts of people across to do five six day immersions at Disneyland or Walt Disney World and just making better humans Make in the most magic, magic happen. Way. Mm -hmm. that's it that, yes and Tony Robbins it's funny I say this it was one of my favorite quotes when I first heard it and it, I have referenced it before but when I heard him say you know how people are celebrated in public for what they work for behind doors for years that is something that I can guarantee that Kevin Smith could speak to, that Walt Disney could speak to, that you could, that I could, that, you know, we put ourselves out there in this way and certainly want to celebrate our wins, but goodness, it hasn't always been easy. So what has maybe been epic fail that you have maybe had that as much as it probably hurt in that moment, you learned far more from it. I, I think that we have to own our fails to show that growth or something that didn't go as well as you may have thought it would have. 
so many. The list is so <laughs> long. I, I love that off the transparency because yeah, it happens. Sure, honestly. And for me, I think even in the last 12 months, not that I'm trying to skip the question, but just to come back around to it, um, I heard someone say reasonably recently, it's not failure, it's feedback. Mm-hmm. And having that shift in the mindset um, has been really, really powerful for me. Uh, but I think failures, oh gosh, now I have to think of one. You're putting me on the spot. Yeah. I think just... And thinking of it as that feedback, I think, you know, what was one of those big feedback moments? Because that's, I've, I've had moments where I feel like I failed or I let myself or others down. And in turn, I gained so much more perspective. So, you know, what, what was one of those perspective shifts that you had that you maybe didn't anticipate coming? Yeah. Okay. So this isn't a failure. Uh, it was actually one of the best things that ever happened to me. So I, like everyone, had to pivot my business completely sort of around April 2020, like everybody else. Uh, and I, I took on a facilitate a contract facilitating position, n- not immediately, but later on. Um, and it was, a, you know, a connection through a connection uh, through my husband. And for me at the time, I saw it as a step backwards because I wanted, I was so intent on doing my own thing. I'd left at, in uh, October, 2019. Um, so September, we'd been to the States, uh, got married in September 19 in New York, honeymoon in New York uh, and uh, Walt Disney World, obviously. I mean, come on. And then- <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and- <laughs> And I'd come back, I'd quit my job and I'd started my business. It was going great guns, right? It was going great guns. And then the pandemic hit and I had to rethink everything because my big draw card was doing in-person events. And then people, I would sign people on as one-on-one clients in sort of the life coaching space, right? And I had to pivot and taking on a contracting position as a facilitator, which I'm a pretty good facilitator also I I didn't really want to go back to working for someone else but Mm -hmm. the opportunities and the things that I've learned just phenomenal and the connections that I've made yeah just and at at the time I was feeling pretty bummed about it and here we are and here we are it's been a major part of my journey and it's been such a huge part of what my business is today because I went that way. And I felt, I felt like I'd failed because I wasn't able to move fast enough during the pandemic to get my stuff or all my ducks in a row. Hmm. So, and I've, I guess now that I've been able to articulate that, I feel like my failures come from, I always tell myself I haven't done enough or I haven't shown up enough. Hmm. So I'm able to, I guess, work with that and shift that and go, okay, how can we do things differently next, next time? Smarter, not harder. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that we have talked before about the tall tall poppy syndrome and how, you know, that can be something that plays into, especially I would think in the mind of an entrepreneur. And so do you mind not only sharing a little bit about what that means, but also did that impact your you know, experience in designing and creating the pop coach and making yourself stand out. Yes. So, so there's sort of two pieces of it for me. So to explain, so we have this concept in Australia, we talk about tall poppy syndrome. So no one wants to be, so if we're all the people in a field of poppies, no one wants to be the one that sticks their head out because it'll get cut off basically. So it's very much about um, the culture here. We're, we're all awesome, loving, wonderful people. Don't get me wrong. Also, if you stand out or try to be different, you'll have a finger waved at you yeah. to be sure, to be sure. So uh, for me, I always, I guess, d- dimmed myself or, or you know, mm-hmm. played everything down. And at some point I've given myself permission to be Amanda 
loud and gregarious and colored hair and all of these things. And I, I feel like the pop coach is, is a bit of a vehicle that allows me to do that. Absolutely. But the other thing for me, and I don't know if this resonates with you, Katie, but coming from corporate, uh, I worked at an organization, great, great company. Also not a lot of women in the company. Um, and it was just really difficult to get promoted, difficult to be seen. And uh, that I think was a big part of me kind of not wanting to be the tall poppy because if you're that strong female, that yeah. that does not translate well in that environment. So I think that contributed to me, you know, yeah. keeping it down here. Uh, but then when I was, when I decided, no, I'm going to have my own gig. Uh, at some point along the way out there, I read the four hour work week and it was not from the perspective of wanting to work four hours. It was like, oh, so that opened the door to me who'd always been told study hard, get a job. Oh, I can, I can actually run my own business. This guy's done it. There's all these other people that do it. It's not for someone else. It can be for me. So, yeah. Do you, I, I love that notion of the tall poppy because I think every culture has something to that effect. However, mm -hmm. in, uh, I think globally, social, social media is a catalyst for a lot of careers. It's a great launching platform. There's incredible ways to connect that we've both found value in. Yes. Has that ever been a hindrance? Is that something that within that tall poppy mentality that it's not seen as a value add to highlight yourself on social media, or is that the exception to the rule? Uh, I, th I think it does play into that. Uh, I, you know, I notice, and my husband and I joke on this all the time, we've got all these stalkers. So people, you, and you're not sure whether they're supporting you or not because they're not proactively interacting with your socials, so to speak. But then you'll see them down the pub or at the coffee shop on a Friday and they'll say, ah, oh, so you were, you know, down at Movie World on the weekend. How was that? And you're like, oh, okay. No, it is a weird <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah there's, there's that piece. And, and it is, I think... I have no problem expressing myself on social media. I, I do. I, my nickname is, is heart react only because I'm like, if it's not positive, I'm not going to post it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, I would willingly share, you know, if we were talking about my challenges or, you know, I, I, I made a mistake, uh, but I'm going to put the positive spin on it because that's yes. just how I roll. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's certainly uh, an environment. I, and it, I feel it is a global thing not just in Australia but definitely definitely is an issue there on social media and I struggled for a long time to be my true authentic self especially on LinkedIn mm. uh, but I've sort of found my voice in the past I want to say two years uh, just because I feel like it's become a more open place yeah. if that makes sense during yes. the pandemic and uh, the Perch community that we're, we're members of, I, that has helped me a lot along the way. So uh, with Dan and Jody and the team there, so just realizing that, yes, I can show up in that corporate space and be Amanda and that's acceptable because for such a long time, I did not see myself as someone that would have any street cred in the corporate world at all. And now I've got people calling me saying, please, can you come and help us out? And that is such an amazing yes. shift for me. Yeah, definitely. That shift comes when you are willing to put yourself out there with people from different backgrounds, different perspectives. And it's, it's what's going to keep changing, not only your business growth, but I just think as societies grow and evolve, we have to find ways to, even if we don't agree with all perspectives, lean into hearing them and understanding them. So I'm glad that you have seen the value of that connection. So let's think about creating the second pillar of one spark. So we've got connect, create, and celebrate. What is a, a either 
program or maybe something you've facilitated? What is an experience that you have created that really defines either who you are, what you stand for, and will give us a better glimpse into the pop coach again? Sure. Uh, I'll go with two, uh, if I may. Uh, So in terms of programs that, that I provide as a, as a more of a complete solution. So I have a system process program called the culture cure. So, and we've spoken about this before. I, when I go out to businesses um, here overseas, wherever I happen to be, I I'm so passionate about Disney and, and other companies that have world-class cultures. So Virgin, Google, the ones that are really just pushing the boundaries and they, they want to be the best in class culturally as an organization. So for me, I'm just sitting there going, okay, so why isn't every company gunning to be exactly like them? Not like, like not exactly like them, but having that world-class standard when it comes to organizational culture. So yeah. the culture cure, so, sorry. Yeah. So the culture cure is my, my um, deliverable, my system process. It's underpinned by uh, a data system. So with culture, it's difficult. It's like grabbing onto smoke. It's one of those things that's really challenging to articulate. So I, I go in and we basically assess all of the humans, the systems, the processes, culture surveys, 360 degree reviews. We get all of that data and we pull it together into uh, a system called the reach ecosystem then I get to sit there. That's my science. So my three pillars are science, art, and magic. So that's the science. The art and the magic is where I come in. So how do we create solutions for the problems that we've identified within the organization? Are we? Do we have high staff turnover? Does our training needs and analysis tell us that our leaders aren't fully developed? What, what can we see? Where are those opportunities? And we use the art if you like to create facilitation experiences trainings workshops to solve for all of those problems and then the magic comes in when we bring all of that together and create an ongoing culture solution so that we've got that constant um trajectory of improvement and like Walt Disney was always all about plussing, right? So what can we do better next time, better next time, better next time? So that that's the system and the process that I provide. So I come in and provide that to organizations here in Brisbane, all around Australia and the world. My little pet favorite was something that I did during the first year of the pandemic. So we have Warner Brothers Movie World here on the Gold Coast. Uh, that's part of the Village Roadshow family of theme parks. And I've, I've run it a couple of times, um, but it was originally just intended as a once-off pilot program and it's called Unleash Your Inner Superhero. So Warner Brothers Movie World have a big setup around um, DC. So they're all around DC superheroes. So think Superman, Green Lantern, uh, Joker, Batman, that whole family, Suicide Squad, all of those guys. So I was, a, and there's a training room set up with all superhero posters and stuff like that. I got dressed up in my superhero outfit and basically it's all centered around what are your superpowers? What's your kryptonite? What's your mission or vision for your future and your life? And then what is your fortress of solitude? So if you're familiar with uh, the Superman stories, that's the place that he goes to contemplate and rest and recover and look after himself so that's a full day immersion experience and I do offer that uh, as part of the culture cure as well but that was a lot of fun that sounds amazing I'm sitting here thinking oh my god did you do that so when you did it with uh, movie world Warner Brothers movie world was it something that you did there with their organizational culture was this an experience that individuals that went there could have what explain more you know so how that the, came the original, about or how- no yeah so the original was I just invited um so clients of mine uh friends and uh associates and colleagues that I'd worked with and I just said hey just we're gonna do this today come with an open mind tell me what you think about it so we filmed it we've got we got photos we got feedback uh, we did 
360 degree reviews around the whole event and got testimonials and stuff. And th this is probably a failure on my part. I haven't done a lot with it, um, but it's an option that I've got there uh, for immersion days as part of the culture cure. So it just depends on what the organization's after. But in terms of people, it's a vehicle for people understanding who they are and understanding the humans around them and what makes them awesome, which is, you know, whether, whether you're doing it as a one-off, you've never met these people before and it's more of a life coaching style environment or it's a team building activity or it's leadership development. It's fully, you know, you can basically tailor it to whatever the organization or the group of people need. Yeah. And it's that immersion, that experiential learning, that getting out in the field away from where you may be more comfortable or typically hiding. So a lot of power in that you need to, yeah, there, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to reach out and say, okay, where are we at with unleashing the inner superhero? Because <laughs> I want to unleash mine. <laughs> well, I I'm there, yeah. that's, yeah, a, yeah. that's a really cool idea. And it's a great way to show that Sometimes those ideas that we have, we lean into it, you had the experience, you got the feedback, and then for whatever reason, you know, life happens, and you're sitting on this, in my mind, a goldmine of awesome, just the adventure that would come with that, so don't discount it, I think we all do it, and for everybody else that's sitting on an idea, you know, go for it take this shot to get wild. Even if you do have one, do what Amanda did and just go for it, record the day, get the feedback. And then you just wait and see where the road takes you. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think there's just a lot of value in backing yourself. I was so, I was always so terrified to back myself. And I think the times that I have it's always paid off and it's one of those situations where don't just commit to the outcome. So commit to the final result. This is what I'm going to do. I don't know how, I don't know where I'm getting the resources from the, the, you know, the funding for it, whatever it might be, just commit to the end goal and then work out the rest later. <laughs> I was just talking about that with somebody yesterday who kept saying, well, I know that these are going to be the questions that they, that the team asks. And I know that they're going to be worried. I said, then tell them that you'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yes. It's important to be realistic, but we all have so many roadblocks that we will even just when you think you have one covered, there's going to be another. So don't let those hold you back. Well, I could talk to you for hours, truthfully. And <laughs> There's so many, just from the fact that you have leaned all into this and I have shared with you how, for me, I sometimes feel uncomfortable sharing about, oh, my Disney history has been a huge platform for my business, but I don't talk about that enough. I mean, I talk about Disney, but not the foundation of my business. And yet here you are leaning all into the pop coach. And what is fascinating is your first trips to Disneyland and Walt Disney World weren't until you were an adult. They weren't until much further down the road of your fandom. So kudos to you for just embracing that piece you love. I mean, what was it like the first time you saw the castle? Okay, so what was it like the first time you saw that castle? I am not going to lie, the flaw coming from Brisbane, Melbourne or Sydney into LA is brutal. Uh, it's about 14 hours and then you so you get in at about six in the morning to LA then you've got to catch whatever transport to Anaheim. Can't check into your hotel till three winning. So <laughs> I I think we probably got to the park at around 11 a.m. We were both tired as all get out. And I just feel like, <laughs> I want to say it was magical and I burst into tears, but I was just so tired. And because um, I was explaining this to Katie earlier, I am not a good flyer. And I owe my husband a lot because he was the one that sort of um, got me 
traveling internationally um, on planes, not just on cruise ships. Like, so I've been, I'd, I'd been international on cruise ships, um, but I'd only flown domestically on a plane. And I would, I would have anxiety around, I'm not worried about it crashing, just that I couldn't leave. And not even claustrophobia. Like I, I was the person that would sit in the back of the meeting, just knowing they could leave. Like, yeah. I'm not like that anymore. I've evolved. I'm a more evolved creature now. So he, he was really patient with me. We flew to New Zealand. Then we flew to Fiji. Then we flew to the States. So it was a bit of a process there. So for me, because I've got that, you know, I can do tired. I can't do anxious on a plane for four hours, 14 hours rather and tired. So I just, my first memories are very foggy. I knew I was stoked to be there. I was like, I remember going, uh, I found pretty quickly the firehouse, the fire station and found the lamp in the window. I was pretty happy about that. Um, I don't, I think we were literally just wandering around kind of zombified. We went back to the hotel, checked in at three, slept for two hours, then went back to the park and then it was on. It was awesome. And I, you know, oh, I haven't got it. I had my Disneyland jacket on before, uh, but you know, bought my Disneyland jacket. Um, yeah. we rode. I don't think we rode, uh, my first ride was, uh, Matterhorn. Very cool. cool. My favorite ride is Haunted Mansion, easily. Uh, but yeah, so for me, going, I must have been, I'm, I'm 36 now. I think I was about, gosh, I must have been 30, 30, 30, 31 when I went for the first time. And that was a big deal for me. And the thing that got me on the plane and through that flight was knowing that I was going to, to the house that Walt built, right? Yeah. So yeah you did it you did I it did, and, I did I did and you're gonna do it again and again I know oh it. yeah <laughs> now that I can get on planes again just try and stop me <laughs> right exactly I love that so let's celebrate one more thing about you that maybe we haven't tapped into maybe we haven't um really brought about but we I just don't think people in general give themselves enough accolades. They don't want their head cut off, right? They don't want to be the poppy. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. That's right. But for a minute, I want you to pop your head up and give yourself a shout out. What is something about Amanda that we really need to um, take away from this that you are proud of? Uh, okay, that's a good one. That's a great one. Uh, so I, I always like to ask people what their superpower is. So my mm. superpower is energy. So, and I, I know I didn't really sell that with that last Disneyland story. <laughs> about <coming laughs> Hey, we all in. hit that moment. Oh yeah. So, uh, so my superpower is energy and just being able to, as a facilitator, as a trainer, as a coach, being able to shift that energy in a room is a really powerful thing. Mm. So getting people, uh, excited about things where, you know, normally they would just be, you know, if we're training in a room, sometimes we're just training in, a, in an office space or a training room. Yeah. How do we make that exciting? How do we make that fun? How do we bring that energy up? So that's something I just have built in. Um, one of my really good mates said to me once, I'm like a battery charger for humans. <laughs> that's, such, Sorry. that's a cool way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, so I'm able to to share my energy with people, and uh, I think th that is something that I'm pretty proud of. Even though I'm I'm not, I don't feel responsible for it. The universe has blessed me thusly, um, but it is something I'm really proud of. And I think we've we've covered off, uh, I guess, a lot of things where I've had to shift my mindset and like grow and really just show up in a different way. So I'm, I'm grateful for all of those experiences and opportunities that I've had, even if at the time they felt kind of yucky, um, here we are and, and yeah. we're better for it. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, I definitely agree with the energy. The You are absolutely able to help feed a positive energy in situations. So thank you. I think that's a very, it's not as easy as people may think think because sometimes you need to be recharged as well so uh, I think that is something often um, forgotten when people are big balls of energy but 
that's why you got to Disneyland and you were like, oh my gosh, I can relax. I'm happy. I'm in that peaceful yes. zone. <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's it. Yes. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Where can people connect with you as the pop coach? Yeah, so uh, best thing to do, uh, probably check me out on LinkedIn. So Amanda Rosatza, I'll spell it for you, R-O-S-A-Z-Z-A. So yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Facebook and Instagram. LinkedIn is probably where I'm posting the most in terms of culture, capability, all that magical stuff. So make sure you check that out. Excellent. Thank you again. I am so excited to have people connect with you and get that bit of pop culture. Uh, it's not the empathetic. It's just that true emotional draw into their organizations. So That's thank it. you so much. Legend. Thanks, Katie. Okay. After that, are you ready to unleash your inner superhero? I know any chance I get to talk with Amanda, the energy and insight she brings really does help me think differently about the way I'm approaching the work I do. The conversation with her about tall poppy syndrome was so fascinating and something that is in a unique contrast to another conversation I often find myself involved in and that's around imposter syndrome. And so I wonder if there's different scenarios or different days or different states of mind that we're in that we either have to check ourselves with that tall poppy syndrome mentality or if we are slowing ourselves down by holding on to that notion of imposter syndrome. So try to find a balance as you move forward this week. Try to find that light that gives you the energy to move forward in the work. Think about how you can unleash that inner power in yourself to empower those around you. I ask that you continue to ignite your spark by embracing the moments that come that will ultimately help you find happiness. Be well, stay curious, and I'll see you real soon. Okay, just kidding. I'm not actually going anywhere quite yet. Because I want you to imagine being told that your child has a genetic disorder for which there are only a few medical treatments. For parents and chil of children with neurofibromatosis, like myself, that is a daily reality. Neurofibromatosis, or NF, causes tumors to grow on nerves throughout the body. There are three diff distinct disorders, NF1, NF2, and squamatosis. As of today, there is no known cure, but you can help change that. Children's Tumor Foundation continues to work to shine a light on NF, including their Shine a Light NF Walk. You can join friends and neighbors virtually or in person to fight to end the condition. And together, we're bringing NF out of the shadows. I ask that if you are interested in supporting this cause that is very near and dear to my heart, you look up more information from the Children's Tumor Foundation because the month of May is Awareness Month, so you'll be hearing a bit about it. Or you could check out the shinealightwalk.org website. Likewise, you could check out my contact information because chances are I'm going to be sharing a whole lot of information. You will also find the link in the episode notes in case you want to connect right away. Fun fact, the side of a hammer is called the cheek. Later, tater.